and we're back. Welcome back and happy Thursday. Today we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about validation. And so up to this point, we've been talking about classifier design, and these were methods, all sorts of methods, Bayesian networks, uh, probabilistic classifiers, decision trees, uh, and k nearest neighbor. And we've been talking about a lot of methods by which you create your classifier. And now we'll switch to system evaluation, which are methods for assessment of the performance of your pattern recognition system. And so when you're debugging a learning algorithm, you have some loss function. And this loss function is a collection or averaging of the difference between the output of your classifier and the ground truth class label. And so this particular example concerns regression. We have the output of your model, output, and this is the ground truth class label. And in the case of regression, this label is real valued. And so we use the squared error difference across all of the examples averaged to compute that coincidence between our hypothesis and the ground truth labeling made by the target function. And so let's say you've built some wonderful linear regression model. And for example, you're trying to use it to predict the price. Maybe it's the price of real estate or what have you. And it works really well on your historical testing data, but it fails miserably when you give it new data that you've collected, new examples. And so let's say you have 10 years worth of housing data, you build a regression model, and then you have a new home, you input it, and it fails miserably. Well, what do you do now? Well, certainly you want to debug what happens, and that debugging concerns the evaluation of its performance. And so there are lots of things you could try. You could say, hmm, well, let me get more training data. Perhaps that new example was very different from all of the training data historical records that it's seen. Maybe the features were not very descriptive. You can try a new feature generation approach, or maybe there are certain parameters you need to choose, change the hypothesis set in some fashion. But which one should you try first? Hmm, that's quite interesting. And so with this diagnosis, you want to figure out what's wrong first, but diagnosing your system takes a lot of time, but it can save you a lot of headache and heartache in the long run. And so ultimately, the goal is what's called low generalization error. That's what you're after. A classifier or pattern recognition system that performs well is one that has a low generalization error. But what is this generalization error? Now, I'm going to introduce some new terms. Out of sample error concerns the error that your pattern recognition system makes on those examples that are outside of the historical data sample values, data values that your system has not yet seen. We're going to call that out of sample error or E out. Now, in sample error, E in, I'm going to refer to as being the error associated with your historical data. Now, this is error associated with the historical data as your hypothesis is trying to mimic in your learning algorithm, trying to find a hypothesis that mimics the ground truth target function. That error is on the in sample data, the historical data, and hence we call it in sample error. And so in statistical learning, we like to look at all sorts of things. And if you want to know more about this, take my machine learning course this fall, the shameless plug, shameless advertisement. But in machine learning, we talk about the physics of learning and all the gory details about all of these underlying things. But in statistical learning, we're concerned about all the theories and the different parts and the physics between various aspects of a learner. And we might look at something called the VC dimension, the complexity. We might look at some of our kernels. We might look at risk minimization, our loss function form, and all sorts of other considerations. Now, in this new machine learning regime, deep networks, we just say, ah, oh, we'll just add more layers and make it work. Okay. Well, that's a bit of, little bit of what happens uh, in deep learning. But I like to take the approach in statistical learning of kind of teasing apart the underlying theories, the physics that impact uh, your learning system. And so a model that does not generalize well to unseen data or new data will fail to predict things 
that aren't in the training sample. And so you want to pick a model or some function from your hypothesis set that has this low generalization error, this out of sample performance. And so let's take a look at ways of doing this. One's called regularization and the other is called validation. And we're gonna focus today on the validation part. And so when we talked about the anatomy of a pattern recognition system, we talked about this hypothesis set and this hypothesis set consists of a set of candidate functions and your learning algorithm searches for every working hypothesis, little h, from within this hypothesis set, big H, and it's trying to find some hypothesis, little h, that best mimics your target function's labeling of labels to instances from your historical data. The good news is that you get examples through your historical data, your in-sample data, your training examples, you know exactly what those ground truth labels are from your target function. And so through this search, you're trying to find some hypothesis, and each hypothesis is evaluated on that training data. And using an error measure, you can determine how closely a particular working hypothesis mimics the ground truth target function's labeling of the in-sample points or historical data until eventually this learning algorithm halts and you get a final best hypothesis we're calling G, and that's our learned function. And so this, each hypothesis in our hypothesis set takes its domain, the same inputs from the distribution that gives us our training examples, and it assigns some class label from our label set. Now, if that label set is discrete, we call it classification. If it's a real values label, we call that regression. Okay, so let's take a look at different hypotheses that you can select. And so here we have a number of data points and we're trying to solve a regression problem and we're trying to fit a particular model uh, to our data. The red points are our data. Maybe we have as our independent variable size of the house and then we have the price on the vertical axis. And we're trying to find that relationship in a regression model between the size and square feet of the house and the price. And so one would tend to think a bigger house costs more, okay, uh, but that's not necessarily the case because depending on the model or the market, you might have a higher price per square foot, so a small house is gonna cost more if that market is uh, more hot, so to speak. There's uh, higher demand with less supply. But nonetheless, one thing we could do is a straight line fit, and that's a simple model. We could do a parabolic fit, and that's a more complex model because it involves a quadratic, x squared. And then we can have a much more complex model. And you notice here, as the degree of the polynomial we're using to fit these data points in our regression model, as that degree increases, the model gets more wiggly. It has more what we call degrees of freedom. It can bend and twist and fold in more complex ways in order to try to fit the data. Now, of course, if we look at this, well, we're underfitting in the first example on the left-hand side. Our data is kind of bendy, if you will, but this model can't quite bend in its degrees of freedom to match the trend of the data depicted from our historical data. And so this is a degree one polynomial and it can't bend enough. The data is too complex in its general trend for the model, our hypothesis set, our family functions to be able to mimic that bendiness, if you will. And so we call this underfitting. And then when we go to a degree two polynomial, it can bend perfectly, it's just right, it works perfectly. But if we go to a higher degree polynomial, we have many more degrees of freedom and we can bend and twist and fold more sophisticated in selecting a particular hypothesis from our hypothesis set to fit the trends of the data. Now, of course, this is called overfitting. It's too bendy. And what the problem that occurs is when we overfit is that the model is so descriptive, has so many degrees of freedom, not only is it bending and fitting the data, it's fitting the noise that's in the data beyond just the general trend in the data. And so what this overfitting means is that when you get a new example, say a house, a new house, X new, it's gonna be grossly wrong because it's so specifically trying to fit the noise in addition to the trends in the given in-sample data, the historical data, that it does very poorly outside of that specific sample, of those specific values for the data that you have in historical data. And so that's generally very, very bad. And so one of the things we wanna do 
is reduce our overfitting and select a model that's descriptive enough to match the trends in the underlying ground truth target function, but not so specific that it's also matching the noise in that data. And so what if the feature dimension is too high? If the feature dimensions are too high, this can get even worse. So with model selection, we don't generalize to unseen data. What we do is we fail to predict things that are not in the tra training example. So we effectively want to pick a model that has a much lower generalization error, but how do we evaluate this idea of generalization error, this performance out of sample on data points we have not seen? So you're given a data set, and this is going to be our data set. You take your data set and you partition it. You partition it into training data, and that's data that you're going to use to search for the best hypothesis. And then you set aside some other data as your test data. Now, when you train, you only use that data that you specified for training, and the set aside data, your model has not seen it. Your learner has not seen it. And then once you're done finding your final best hypothesis, you bring back out this test data and you input it to that model. And now from the perspective of that model, it has not yet seen this test data, even though it was all carved out of the training data or the data sample or data set that you started with. And so you're effectively mimicking this idea of out of sample by setting aside some subset of the data that you have available. You're treating one subset as the training data that gives you your final best hypothesis, and then you furnish this test data, and it acts like it has not seen, your model has not seen this data, and it acts like out of sample new data. Okay, and so we're gonna use this in two different approaches to try to reduce this overfitting, and reducing overfitting gives you good generalization error, this out of sample performance. And essentially, your out of sample performance, E out, is going to be dependent on your hypothesis, your working hypothesis. And the reason for that is that for each hypothesis, when you run H of X on all of your training data, it's going to either agree or disagree with the ground truth class label. So the out of sample error on this set aside test data is going to be dependent on the particular choice of working hypothesis. And so that's equal to the in-sample data, that's the performance on that set-aside training data, plus some penalty that's gonna discourage solutions that are complex. So for example, in the case of polynomials, what it's gonna do is penalize you in this selection uh, for models that have a lot of degrees in them for high degree polynomials. And that's going to end up preferring in the selection of working hypotheses, it's going to prefer those little H's drawn from your hypothesis set associated with a low degree. And so this overfit penalty is going to guide along with the in-sample error a final best hypothesis, working hypothesis H, which will lead to a final best hypothesis G that has a good generalization error or out of sample performance. Now, how do we do this? There's two ways we can do this. One is called regularization. And with regularization, we have a penalty that penalizes for overfitting and we're trying to minimize this expression. And then we also have validation. And what validation does is it estimates this out of sample error directly. And it uses that estimate for out of sample error as a proxy for directly how your model will perform out of sample. So let's take a look at how this might work. So let's take a look at the anatomy of a pattern recognition system. And in that, we mentioned an error measure. And this error measure is responsible for measuring the coincidence between the working hypothesis that we're searching through the hypothesis set for and the ground truth target functions labeling of the in-sample data. And so this error measure can take many different forms. And one form is the squared error loss. That's for regression where we have a real valued label. And the binary error where we have a discrete class label it could be plus one, minus one, could be a pineapple, cat, and dog, and so forth. And so when we take the expectation of our error measure for the hypothesis with respect to each of the data points X from our in-sample data, that expectation with respect to all possible data 
given the distribution over data points, that's going to be our out-of-sample error for the hypothesis. And so we have a probability distribution that we talked about, and our probability distribution, P of X, is responsible for giving you the data points that you see, P of X. And so that P of X is responsible for giving you both the in-sample points, the label instance pairs, X1, Y1, X2, Y2, and so forth, up to and including Xn, Yn. It's responsible for giving you both these labeled instances for historical data, as well as the new data points that you have not yet seen. And so the expectation with respect to that probability distribution over features for the data, for the error measure that measures coincidence between your working hypothesis and the ground truth labelings, that's equal to your out of sample error. And if we were to look at the variance of it, we would call it sigma squared, which is just variance, and that variance is a constant. And so we can have different error measures, but in general, the expectation of the error measure for a hypothesis is it's out of sample error, and the variance is just how much it changes from one instantiation of a data set to the next. And so for the validation set, what do we do? Well, for a validation set, we have our original data that we're given, and we carve out of it two subsets. One is going to be our set aside for our test data, and that's going to act like our out-of-sample estimate. And then we have this validation data set. Now, this validation set is going to be used for us to select the right parameters for our model, one that has good generalization error. And what this validation set is going to do is going to give us an estimate of this out-of-sample error. So let's assume we have a validation set carved out of our training data, and it has big K many instances from our training data. Now, these act like they're out of sample. And so our validation error is nothing more than the average pointwise error for a hypothesis for each one of these data points that we carved out for our validation set. That's eval. And so if we were to take the expectation of eval, we take the expectation of this whole expression. Now, due to linearity of expectation, this expectation comes inside of our summation. And then we get one upon k, the sum for k goes from one to big k, our expectation of the pointwise error. Now, of course, the expectation of pointwise error is just e out, out of sample error for that hypothesis. And we're adding it to itself k many times, divide by k, that's just our out of sample error. And so this demonstrates that the expectation of validation error is out of sample error. And this means our validation error is a good estimate for out of sample error. Now, if we were to look at the variance, okay, we do the same calculation, and the variance of this validation error, well, the variance of a constant, uh, that constant is squared, and we get 1 over k squared, variance of the summation, the variance of the sum is the same as the sum of the variance, so we bring that variance in, and we get 1 upon k squared, the sum for k goes from 1 to big K of the variance of this pointwise error. And so the variance of that pointwise error is sigma squared, we said before. So we're adding sigma squared to itself k many times. So we have k sigma squared over k squared, which is just sigma squared over k. And so if we were to look at the value of the validation error, on average, it's equal to the out-of-sample error plus or minus the standard deviation, which is the square root of the variance of the validation error. Now, of course, in big O notation, sigma squared is a constant, so we just say big O of 1, but then we'd write radical K in the denominator. And so this variance, then, is the square root, standard deviation is uh, the square root of the variance, and you'll note here that the sigma squared is a constant, so we just write in big O notation a 1 in its place. And so that means our validation error is going to be equal to our out-of-sample error plus or minus this delta we're calling big O divided by radical 1 over radical, this big O of 1 over radical K. Now that just says if our validation set is larger, that means we're going to be closer and closer and closer. Eval is going to be a better estimate of E out. If our validation set K is size is smaller, that means our validation error is going to be a poorer estimate because this standard deviation is going to be larger. And so let's take a look at how this validation set is carved out of our data set. 
our training set. So you start out with a data set, and this, mind you, in this discussion, we've already set aside our test set, right? So we're just going to talk about N as being the, the training set out of which you take your validation. And so you have K points uh, for a data set we'll call DVAL, and that's for validation. And the remaining N minus K, we're going to call DTrain, your training set. And so, of course, if you have a small validation set, then eval is going to be a bad estimate for e out. If you have a large k, then eval is going to be a good estimate. So even though it's a good estimate, what happens is that if k is large, yes, it's a good estimate, but you're robbing the training set of instances. And if you have less instances in the training set, your performance is going to be poor. So essentially you're saying, I'm absolutely convinced that the performance is going to be bad out of sample. So there's this natural tension between the size of the training set and the size of the validation set. And to learn more about this natural tension, take my machine learning course where we talk in detail more about the physics of uh, learning. But nonetheless, in this graph, we have on the horizontal axis the number of data points. And as k gets bigger, we go in this direction. And as n minus k, the training set gets bigger, we go on the right-hand side. And so your in-sample error, when you have a larger training set, right, if n minus k gets bigger, then k gets smaller, well, in-sample error is going to do better. Out-of-sample error is going to get smaller because your performance gets better out of sample, but you have a poorer estimate through eval. And so if k is really, really big, k increases in that direction, n minus k is going to be smaller, and you're going to have a smaller training set, so out-of-sample error is going to be greater because you have less instances on which to train. And so there's this trade-off. And so one of the things that we can do is we start with our data set of size n, and you take out k many of these data points for your validation set, leaving n minus k for your training set. And now when you train on this reduced training set, n minus k, we're going to call that g minus. It's the reduced version of the final best hypothesis because you trained on a smaller training set. And so its out-of-sample error performance is not going to be as good. Now, of course, the validation error that you're going to get, eval, you're going to evaluate that based on that suboptimal classifier. And you're going to run that on your validation set. And so you're going to run an estimate of out-of-sample error on that diminished classifier uh, or pattern recognizer recognition system that was trained on that reduced training set. And so if K is large, you're going to have a bad estimate, and this G minus is going to be pretty poor relative to the true out-of-sample error. And so you start out, and you have your training set. There's your G bar. And then you run that G bar, that final best hypothesis on the diminished training set. You run it through that validation set, and you get eval on that G minus, that diminished or that more impoverished final best hypothesis, the suboptimal one. And so if K is very small, then you're going to have high variance, as we said. If K is very big, then the difference between G minus and the real G, which is the final best hypothesis on the full data set is going to be very, very big because you're essentially robbing your learner from the full data set if K is very big. And so the more data points you have, the better, in general, the out-of-sample performance. Okay, and so a typical value uh, for K is roughly one-fifth of the total amount of data that you have. But that's not a hard and fast rule. It's just kind of a rule of thumb that's typical. And so a validation set is not the same as a test set. Test set is set aside, and it's used to verify the performance of your learner on new data, the out-of-sample error. And so the estimate of E out does affect your learning, and it tells you how the model choices that you make can affect the out-of-sample performance because you can use this eval to select different parameters, things like the complexity of your model, whether you use a degree one, degree two, or degree four polynomial for your regression, for example. And so essentially, as you train your model, uh, this overfitting occurs when your out-of-sample error 
starts to increase. And there's this elbow in the graph here, and along the horizontal axis, we have a number of rounds called epochs of which we train your learner. And then on the vertical axis, we have error. So as you give it more data over time, the in-sample error, as it's searching through the hypothesis set, starts to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, out-of-sample error also starts to get smaller. It tracks with the in-sample error, but there's some point where it starts to overfit and the out-of-sample error starts to diverge, starts to increase. At that point is where you have overfitting occur. And so one of the things you can do with validation is implement this idea of early stopping. You stop and you select the model that gives you this best or lowest out-of-sample error estimate before overfitting starts to happen. And so one of the things that happens with uh, this validation, if you're using it to select among different hypotheses, is that the validation set is optimistic. It's better than typical, and your performance will appear to be better than it really is. So let's suppose you have two hypotheses, and you're going to use a validation set to select between two of them. One hypothesis might be the degree uh, two polynomial for regression. One might be the degree four polynomial. And let's assume that the out-of-sample error for the first hypothesis is 0.5, and so the second hypothesis is also 0.5. And so let's say your error estimates are E1 and E2, and they're both uniform on the real number line in the closed interval between 0 and 1. And so let's say the hypothesis that you're going to select is going to be that particular hypothesis associated with the minimum error estimate. And so you have two error estimates, E1 and E2, and you could have E1 greater than 0.5, E2 greater than 0.5, you can have E1 less than 0.5, E2 less than 0.5, you can have E1 greater than 0.5 while E2 is less than 0.5, and then likewise you can have E1 less than 0.5 while E2 is greater than 0.5. And so these are all the four alternatives concerning error with respect to E1 and E2. Now, if you were to select the best one, one of the things that you think of is what is the probability that one of them is going to be less than 0.5? Well, here we have one of them less than 0.5. Here we have one of them less than 0.5. Here we have one of them less than 0.5. So with probability 0.75, three out of the four alternatives, you're going to have one of them less than 0.5. So if you wanted to know is the error less than 0.5, well, you have a greater chance, very optimistically, that if you're selecting from among these two hypotheses, that the error is going to be less than 0.5, and therefore it, this appears to be much better than it really is. And so there's certainly an optimistic bias when you're using this validation set to select a number of alternative hypotheses based on this estimate for E out that you get from the validation set. So that's something to watch out for. And so let's take a look at this model selection. And let's say we have a bunch of different models. And a model, we said, consists of a learning algorithm and a hypothesis set. And together, that's called a model. And we also have our error measure. And that error is part of it. And that guides the learning algorithm as it searches through working hypotheses drawn from your hypothesis set. And so you have a bunch of different models, and these hypotheses can be different parameterization. So you could have a degree one polynomial, degree two polynomial, degree three polynomial, and so forth. And so here we have a number of different hypotheses, and you take your training set, you split out your validation set from it, and that training part is of size n minus k, and that validation set is of size k. So now you take your reduced training set, and you train the first hypothesis set with it, the second, the third, the fourth for your learning algorithm, and you get a final best hypothesis G1 minus from the first hypothesis set, and it has a minus because it's reduced in size because you carved out your validation set of size big K. You have your second final best hypothesis reduced, G2 minus, and GM minus for each of these M many different versions of your hypothesis set. Now each one corresponds to a different model, and you might choose different parameterizations, for example, different degree polynomials. So now that you have your set of M many final best hypotheses that are reduced in the performance because they're on the smaller training set size, size N minus K, we then run the validation set through them to get the error 
estimate for the outer sample error. So we run it through the first one, G1 minus, we get our error estimate E1, our outer sample error estimate E2, and so forth. And then we pick the best error estimate, which is whichever out of sample error estimate from a validation error is the smallest. And from that, let's assume it was H2, or we just more generally call it H star. We're going to say, okay, well, if it's error estimate two was the smallest, we're going to take H2. So if the error estimate E star, we're going to take H star, which is the corresponding hypothesis that, that was responsible for the smallest eval or estimate of out of sample error. And what this is saying, this eval, the evals are down here, the different validation errors, that's saying, okay, well, on this limited data set, a particular hypothesis has the best out of sample error estimate. So now that you have the best one, you take your training set, combine it with the validation set for the full training set, and then you feed that into that winning hypothesis to make it the best it can be, which is your ultimate final best hypothesis. And so that's the model with the smallest out of sample error estimate. And because you've given it now the full training set that hasn't been diminished, it should do even better than before because it has more training examples. Okay, so we select a model HM star using the validation set, and eval is a biased estimate of the outer sample error for that diminished final best hypothesis for that particular hypothesis. And the illustration in selecting between two models we had before. But out of sample error gets smaller with more samples, but eval gets bigger with a smaller validation set. With a bigger K, the estimate of E out gets more reliable. But so they get closer if we were to look at their performance curve. And so here in this graph, we have along the horizontal axis the validation set size, that's eval. And then we have here along the vertical axis, uh, we have the expected error. And so the blue curve is validation error, and the red curve is out of sample error. And you'll notice here as the validation set size gets bigger, K gets bigger, these two, the gap here, gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And smaller. So this idea of a bigger K gives us a better estimate for out of sample, but if K is too big, we're going to rob the classifier uh, so much of training data that it's going to be poor out of sample error, it's poor generalization performance. And so in terms of contamination, you want to make sure that you're not using the validation set too, too much. The training set is very contaminated, meaning that your classifier uses it as it searches through the hypothesis set. It's looking at it again and again and again and again at those instances as it considers each working hypothesis. The test set is clean. You only use it once at the end, but the validation set is slightly contaminated. So yes, you can use the validation set in order to determine what your model choice is, but you want to tread lightly with this because the more you use it, the more contaminated it gets and you get diminishing returns because it is a biased estimate. Okay, so let's look at cross-validation. We have this natural tension between the validation set and the out-of-sample error. If you have small k, well, you kind of want small k because if your validation set is size, its size is small, then you are going to get good out-of-sample performance. But if it's too small, you're going to have a poor estimate of out-of-sample error through your validation set. So you want small k so you can get good out of sample performance. But at the same time, you want large k because you want your validation error to be a good estimate of out of sample error. So you want the validation set to be small and at the same time, you want it to be large. So how can you do this? Well, uh, one of the things we can do is called leave one out cross validation. Now with this cross validation, we select one point to be the validation set. Now, is that a good estimate for out of sample error? Eh, it's not very good, but the good news is if you leave one point out for validation, your validation set K is of uh, size, K is only of size one, this leaves N minus one points for training. And so that means you have really big training sets. So let's make a definition, let's call it script DN to be that training set you get by leaving out the nth data point for validation. So that means you have a really big training set and that satisfies 
this idea of a big training set leading to good out of sample performance because k is small. Well, that's good news. Now, if we take this dn, we have a d1, a d2, a d3, up through dn, we have n many of these data sets for training because we can leave out the first one, the second one, the third one, up through and including the nth uh, data point for the validation set of size k equals 1. And so the final hypothesis we learned from the dn is going to be gn minus, and gn minus is going to be pretty good because we only left out a single data point of the n many data points for validation. So now our error estimate is going to be eval, and that's going to be the pointwise error on that single data point. So the cross-validation error then is the average over each one of these individual pointwise validation errors for the entire set. And so we're going to average EN for D1, D2, D3, D4, and so forth. And so when we average this out, what we end up getting is a very good estimate. And this average means that our validation set is large because we're putting together all of these N many individual points, and that satisfies this criteria on the other side where we have a large K because we're considering this average involving all of the N many data points that we have. And so you can think of each EN as belonging to a validation set, and then it becomes respectable because you have N points to validate when you take this average over all of these pointwise validation errors. Okay. And so here's an example of this leave one out cross validation. Here we have a line on the plane, and we're going to have three data points, and we're going to use this line to fit it uh, to this data set. And we have the first one we're leaving out, and we fit this line to the second, the second and third point, and then we leave out the second one. Here's our linear fit. And we leave out the third one. Here's our linear fit. So you take each one of these errors for the first point, for the second point, for the third point, left one out, and then you take the average. And this is our cross-validation error. And so let's do this on two different models. We have the same three data points. We're going to have a linear model line on the plane, and we're also going to use a constant line. So this constant line is straight across, horizontal, and it pierces the y-axis. Now, of course, this constant line is this f of x is equal to some constant. And so if we do that same scheme here with the constant line, well, that line can only go halfway between the y component of each one of the data points. And so if we leave out the first one, well, this is the line that we get, best fit. If we leave out the second one, this is our best fit. If we leave out the third one, this is our best fit. Now, if we average the errors for that constant model, we see that the cross-validation error is smaller for the constant line than the line on the plane. And so, and as such, the one we're going to pick is the constant line, it's a better model for fitting this data set of three points using our cross, and we get that selection using our cross validation error. And so it kind of seems non intuitive that a constant line would be a better fit than a line, but if you look at it, yeah, absolutely, that line tends to overfit more than that constant. Okay, and so you can certainly leave more than one out. Now, of course, if you have a really large data set, say a million data points, it's not practical to leave one out because you're going to have D1 through D1 million. And that's a lot of different data sets over which to train your classifier and then compute this cross-validation error. So we want something that's a little bit more feasible, and we can do that by cross-fold validation. And so essentially, instead of leaving one out, we take our data set, we divide it into a number of folds, k many folds, and a fold is nothing more than a partitioning of your data set into some number of chunks. And so we divide it up into k chunks, and then we hold out one of those 1k chunks of your data, and then we set that aside for validation, and then we train on the remaining n minus k points. And so this is called k-fold cross-validation, and your cross-validation error is just the average over those k-many holdouts for validation, and you use that as the selection criteria for your model choice instead of the leave one out. And so a typical choice for k 
is tenfold cross-validation. And this gives you a good feasible balance between this making K small that we talked about and making K large. And it makes it much more feasible, especially when you have large data sets. And so when you validate your pattern recognition algorithms, it's really important to make sure you choose your folds carefully because the trade-offs you make can dramatically impact what you believe your results say about the ultimate performance of your learning system. And so with that, uh, that's all I have to say. And as usual, please stay healthy, uh, stay safe, and I'll see you all on Tuesday.